Amidst a big push by the Defense Department to focus on the Pacific region, RIMPAC 2012 is heating up. Hello and welcome, I'm Petty Officer Michael Wilkin. The exercise in and around the islands of Hawaii involves U.S. Marines and Canadian Forces soldiers who are conducting urban combat training that will enhance multinational and joint interoperability. Marine Corporal Ben Everly reports. Get up! Get up on your feet! Hands behind your back! Canadian Forces are nearly 4,000 miles from their home base in Shiloh, Manitoba. The job of their American hosts? try to make their visit as unpleasant as possible, at least for three days. Uh, basically what we're doing is we're being uh, opposition forces for the Canadians so that way they get the best training possible and in the scenarios that we're running. More than 120 Canadian soldiers operated with and went up against U.S. Marines to conduct urban combat training. It was part of this year's Rim of the Pacific exercise, or RIMPAC 2012, being conducted in and around the Hawaiian Islands. It's a, it's a lot different than what we're used to. It's a lot more realistic, uh, allowing troops to break through uh, plateaus and get a better threshold on their uh, soldier abilities. The training also exposed U.S. Marines to new tactics, techniques, and procedures. RIMPAC is conducted every two years and began back in 1971. Alright, now put all your shoulder pressure in like you're going to shoot and see if it's still on. 1,000 meters? Right, which is the same like the saw with this long barrel. It's good for 1,000 meters suppression for accurately. So this thing all the way down has like, just like the RCO, how wide the little thing is, how wide the man's shoulder should be at that distance. It's good for up to 1,000 meters. And then up top here is really good for close quarters combat. It's just like an EOTech. It's got one little dot in the middle that doesn't matter what your eye relief is or anything like that, it's just gonna be right on the target. So it's really good for like close quarters when you're looking over your sights, you can have both your eyes open when you're going through a house and you, wherever that little red dot is, that's your rounds are gonna impact. So it's pretty sweet. And it's what, 3.5 magnification?
Johnston Island portion of the 1962 Dominic Test Series, conducted by Joint Task Force 8, included two types of tests. One involved a number of high-altitude nuclear detonations carried aloft by various missiles launched from the island for a study of the effects produced by such detonations. And the other was a group of five airdrops over the ocean clear of the island, but within the Johnston Island danger area. The High Altitude Series had these basic objectives. First, there was an evaluation of the missile kill mechanisms produced by high altitude detonations. Secondly, an investigation of the effects of such detonations on our electromagnetic surveillance and tracking capabilities and on the maintenance of long range communication systems. The purpose of this program was to provide points of departure for still further determinations. The starfish, bluegill, and kingfish tests were launched by modified Thor missiles. The missile carried externally mounted instrumentation pods for each event to collect data on blast overpressures and thermal and nuclear radiation as potential ICBM kill mechanisms. On the 8th of July, Starfish Prime, the second try at Starfish, was launched and was entirely successful. The warhead detonated at an altitude of 400 kilometers, 31 kilometers south of Johnston Island. This is how it appeared in still pictures from Maui Island in the Hawaiian chain. On 25 July, the Thor vehicle for Bluegill Prime had a one-of-a-kind casualty. Both missile and warhead burned on the launching pad. to the pad was extensive, as could be plainly seen next morning. Less visible, but more dangerous, was the long-life radioactive contamination of the pad area from the warhead. It was obvious that this would cause a significant delay in the operation. The scheme for using an airborne test instrumentation array had been used during the Christmas Island series in a trial and backup role. The plan provided for an airborne package made up of the B-52 drop aircraft and Johnston Island as the advanced base for P-2V surveillance aircraft and for recovery of the sampler controllers and the radioactive samplers. On the carrier Princeton, underway in the drop area, overall control was maintained by the task force commander in flag plot. 